I would like to invite on stage Bruno, so please give him a big round of applause. Hey everyone, I would like to start by, by saying something interesting. Uh, this is not my first talk, I have done this a couple of years uh, back, uh, but every time you do it, you just get really nervous before you go on stage. So I don't know who developed this game, but uh, my body is very bugged, I would like to report the, this bug. I shouldn't be nervous after doing this so, so many times. So, hey everyone, uh, my name is Bruno Rocha. Uh, I work, actually, sorry, uh, I casted this incorrectly. I should have done the proper mirroring. Use a separate display, please. There you go, I need my notes. All right, so, hey everyone, I'm Bruno Rocha. I work with iOS uh, at Spotify. Uh, the name of this talk is Keeping Swift Apps Small. And as the name implies, I want to talk to you about an often overlooked uh, but still quite important aspect of mobile development, um, the size of our apps. This number that shows up in the App Store that gives us an idea of how long it will take you for, for you to download the app and how much storage it will take after that. Uh, we care a lot about this value at Spotify, so much that I'm here showing you it today. And, and as part of, of this talk, I want to tell you why. I'm going to start by giving you an introduction to why companies like Spotify care about this value, uh, and then spend the rest of the talk showing not only some of the different tools that we have built to track this problem, uh, but also some concrete techniques that we have used in the past to reduce Spotify's app size uh, that you can actually also use for your app if that's what you want. All right, so let's dive in. So I'm an engineer, so I am very eager to start showing you a bunch of really crazy optimization, compiler, nerd stuff on how you can keep your app size low. Uh, but before we do that, I think it's important to take a step back because I imagine probably some of you may be thinking, should I really care about app size? Like, after all, even the cheapest iPhones today have quite a lot of storage to the point where I would imagine that no one really bothers looking at how big an app is before you download it, like at least I, I don't. Uh, so why should you care about this? So of course, if you, if you look back a couple of decades ago, you would find that this type of hardcore optimization used to be really common. So technology like storage used to be really expensive, uh, not to mention how decent internet itself was something that only a select field had access to. Uh, but as you know, this is not really the case anymore. Uh, fast internet is so widespread nowadays that even cellular connections that you get on the street can be just as fast as your local Wi-Fi. And storage has also gotten cheap enough and better over the decades that nowadays the minimum storage you get on a flagship iPhone is 128 gigabytes, which is a lot. Not long ago, this was 16 gigabytes on the iPhone 6. So why do companies like Spotify care about this? Uh, what difference does it make if an app like Spotify gets a couple of megabytes smaller and why would you go to the trouble of doing this in the first place? And well, the answer is because although we as developers attending a conference here in Europe can say that this is our reality, uh, this is not everyone's reality. Uh, many emerging markets like Brazil, where I was born, they still sort of live in this reality where, in that reality, sorry, where high technology was unattainable. Uh, although the technology absolutely does exist in those countries, uh, most people just can't afford it. It's too expensive. Uh, in fact, uh, I remember an interesting story from a couple of years back. So when the iPhone 7 or something was released in Brazil, uh, there was some sort of legend going around because there were some news articles coming out that they used to say the following. They did the math and they realized that you could get a flight from Brazil all the way to Miami, Florida, US, party hard for like one week, go crazy, buy an iPhone, and then come back, and it would still be cheaper than if you had just bought it locally at the, the App Store. It was just that excessive. I actually know some people who did that. Uh, yeah, also, if you, if you like video games, same thing happened with the PlayStation 3. The original PlayStation 3 model in Brazil was so expensive that people just thought it was a joke or something like that. Uh, today, it's not like that. Uh, things have improved a lot. The laws have been changed. Uh, but this sort of problem still exists in, in different ways. So what does this mean? Uh, basically, if you were to survey how users in these countries are equipped in terms of, of phones, you would find that although a lot of people do have iPhones, uh, 
they're generally older ones and pretty much always with the minimum storage possible that you could get for that particular device, uh, which today is a lot, as we mentioned, but remember, these are older devices, so it was probably really low, like 16, 32 or worse, 16 gigabytes. Uh, but it's not just storage and devices that are expensive. Data also tends to be a really big problem in these countries. Here in Europe, I think it's really common for people to have like unlimited data packages, super fast 5G, uh, but in emerging markets, the situation is often the opposite. Uh, most people have constrained data packages, so like you can only use it a little bit and they, they just cut you off or charge you obscene amount of monies. Uh, and also, the actual internet there tends to be painfully slow, if you even have it. Uh, because at least in the case of Brazil, which is what I have experience with, uh, there are still large chunks of the country that just have no coverage uh, if you're doing it on, on, on the fly. But this fact, uh, this is quite intriguing, right? So if you look at this, you would think that this is an indication of something bigger. And indeed it was. So Google was the first company to notice that there was something cheeky going on here. And to find exactly what was happening in 2017, uh, they run a study on Thailand, I believe. And what they found out in that in these, in these sort of types of countries, 70% of people considered the size of the app before downloading it out of concerns for storage, but also data costs. Now, you might think, okay, but that's emerging markets. Like, who cares about that? But, well, actually, emerging markets is 85% of the world's population. That's a crap ton of people. So... By putting these two facts together, what they have found out also is that even in today's world of like super fast and cheap technology, there is still a really strong correlation between the size of an app and how many downloads it gets. To be more specific, what they found is that for every six megabytes increase to the app size, uh, they saw a drop of 1% in the, that app's install conversion rates. So now there's there's something for me to mention here. This is actually Android numbers. And before you lynch me for bringing this here, I will, I will explain why. Uh, the reason I'm showing you this instead of iOS numbers is because the iOS number basically doesn't exist. Uh, the App Store doesn't allow you to A-B test the binary of the app. You can only A-B test the actual listing. So because Apple never done public research on, on this, uh, we, don't, we can't say for sure what the iOS number is. Uh, but although, I can show you something. Uh, experience shows that this is also true for iOS. Uh, in fact, when it comes to iOS, the situation might be even worse because at least Android supports Delta updates, meaning that when you update your app on the Play Store on Android, uh, you only download the difference between two builds. Uh, but on iOS, you have to download the entire binary again and again every time you submit an update, which means that this cost or, or, or friction for for downloading doesn't happen just uh, when you install it the first time, but on iOS, also every time you update it. That can be really bad. To make it worse, when your app is larger than 200 megabytes, the App Store by default starts even showing warnings that the app you're trying to download is too big if you're doing it outside of Wi-Fi. I don't have concrete data on this to show you, but many developers report that once they break this 200 megabyte barrier, uh, their downloads start just collapsing because of mainly this warning. So with all that in mind, I think the, the case for app size becomes a little bit clearer. Uh, if you don't want to lose or anger 85% of the world's population, you should be paying attention to your app size. And that's exactly what you see in large tech companies like Spotify, uh, who are developing product, products whose target audience is essentially everyone. How deeply you should care about app size, it's hard to say because it really depends on what you're building and your size and everything else. Uh, but I think we can safely say that you should at least be caring to some degree. At Spotify specifically, uh, we have built an entire division dedicated not only to keeping track of metrics like app size, uh, but also researching ways for how we can improve them. So how do we do it? Uh, when it comes to Spotify specifically, nowadays we have a wide variety of systems for all things related to app size, like tracking, attribution, uh, alerting, and whatnot. Uh, but out of all of these things, by far the one I think is the most interesting for me to show you today, and that you can actually do it yourself if you want to, is the app size CI check. Uh, what this does is basically what the name implies. Every time we make a pull request to our iOS repo, after the CI finishes compiling the app, uh, we ask one of our systems to compare the contents of the compiled binary 
uh, with that of the main branch. Uh, and the result uh, is a report that shows you, that shows the developer not only this, how much the size of the binary changed as a result of those changes, uh, but also where exactly those changes came from, uh, like a specific class on your sweep code or, or a new resource that you added on your pull request. Uh, this detailed binary diff, in our case, comes from a third party tool called eMerge. Uh, but if you aspire to have a check like this, you can actually start much simpler than that. Just simply looking at the size of the compiled binary, uh, it's a great start and already quite useful. There are several reasons why we have built this check, but the most relevant one here is that this actually allows us to enforce good quality practices at Spotify. Uh, you see, the system doesn't just tell you what the difference between the, the compiled binaries was it actually has the power to block pull requests if it finds that the difference is, is too big, keeping it away from the app until it's actually sure that you have done your best to optimize this code, which I'll actually show you later. Uh, by the way, before I continue, there's an important side note to mention. Uh, in iOS, there is a difference between install size and download size. Uh, the number that you see on the App Store is the install size, which is the uncompressed, unencrypted size of your app. Uh, but what we actually will download is generally less than that because Apple compresses it beforehand, uh, which is something that we refer to as download size. Both of these are numbers that you can predict. Uh, there are several ways to do that. Uh, in general, Apple's recommended way is for you to generate a so-called app thinning size report to Xcode. Uh, but my point is, when we talk about app size numbers, most of the time we're referring to install size specifically. We don't worry too much about download size. Uh, there are two reasons for that. Uh, number one, install size is what you actually see on the App Store. You cannot generally see the download size. You, you can, but uh, it's tricky. Uh, and number two, when you improve your install size, normally you're also automatically improving your download size. So in that sense, they're equivalent, and so it makes sense to focus on whatever one is the easiest, which is install size in this case. Uh, so for the rest of this talk, just keep in mind that when I show you numbers like this, it's usually install size that I'm referring to. All right, side note. So I was saying that Spotify, if you try to push a pull request that increases the size of the app too much, uh, this check is gonna stop you until you optimize your code. Uh, but what if you can't optimize it? Like anything that you add to your binary will eventually result in added size. So if you're working on some massive complicated feature, uh, it might very well be the case that you just can't do anything. Uh, you also need to be aware that sometimes that there are downsizes to optimizing code for size, like lost performance in some reasons. So sometimes this is just not the right way to go. So the way we account for this is by having something that we call the app size policy. This is basically now, now when, where it gets bureaucratic. So this is basically some massive document that describes in more detail everything that I'm showing you today about why we care about app size, different ways of which we track it, and uh, what you can personally do to reduce the impact of your code, which I'll show you very soon. Uh, but most importantly, uh, it defines a concrete exception process uh, for when you believe that you should not do these things and actually push something that will increase the, the size of the app uh, by quite a lot. Uh, in most cases, what we ask people to do is essentially prove that your feature is what we call business positive, or in other words, that the benefit that you think that feature will bring to, to the company or the app uh, is larger than the loss in downloads that you have because you just increased the, the size of the app. In some cases, we even check this recurrently to, to determine whether or not we should remove a feature from the app. So if you merge something that was really big uh, because you believed it would be good for the company, uh, but it turns out that people don't actually care about it, no, nobody likes the feature, uh, we can actually use this policy as, a, as an argument for just cutting the feature entirely from, from the app. So in practice, we, we have a lot more stuff than just those two systems that I showed you. Uh, but you don't need to have all of this stuff to, to be able to work with something like app size at your company. Something as simple as defining how much you care about app size is already a great step. And with a PR check in place to back this up, uh, you already be able to go a long way before you need any of this other complicated stuff that, uh, that I'm gonna show you today. All right, so we talked a lot about concepts and ideas, but I'm sure what you truly want to see is how do you actually improve app size in iOS? I could talk to you all day about tracking systems and alerting and, and whatnot, uh, but if you don't actually have ways to improve this metric, then it's kind of pointless, right? 
So let's pretend that we work at Spotify and we open a pull request that is causing the CI to complain that it's going to increase the size of the app too much. What can we do to actually reduce this impact? Well, as it turns out, there is one very easy way to not have issues with size in iOS. You just delete everything. So you can't have issues with app size if you don't have an app in the first place. Uh, but of course, that's not going to sit very well with your, your manager. This is literally my manager. No, it's not. <laughs> so, so in practice, when we talk about optimizing code for size, what we are truly looking for is the ability to reduce impact without re actually removing any functionality. This sounds tricky, but it's actually something we as developers know very well, because this is simply another way of saying that we're looking to remove overhead from the binary. So how do we do that? The good news is there is no shortage of unnecessary overhead in iOS. If you do have issues with app size in your code, it's almost certain that you can do something about it. The bad news, though, is that this overhead is not necessarily packed together into one specific place that you just go there and fix it, like in this made-up example where all of the overhead is in the Swift layer and very close to each other, very nicely packed together. In reality, you have something like this, where the overhead is all over the place and is spread out across all of these different layers that compose your iPhone. What this means is that the amount of things that you could potentially do to reduce the impact of a pull request is so large, uh, it's just impossible for me to show you all today. Uh, you could literally write entire books about this. So what I would like to do instead that I think will work better is the following. I'm going to grab all of these separate and really complicated, unrelated problems. I'm going to group them together into smaller groups. And then I'm going to give you an overview of what these groups mean, some examples of problems that we, and how we have dealt with them at Spotify, and how you can get deeper into the subject if you think that this is something that interests you. You're not going to leave here knowing everything you could possibly know about these areas. Uh, but hopefully, this will give you a good enough idea that will allow you to understand and maybe even already start applying some of these concepts if that's what you want. So let's do that. When it comes to overhead in, I in, in iOS, I personally like to group these problems into three different areas. Swift overhead, resources overhead, and project or operating system overhead. Out of these three areas, I would say that resources overhead is probably the one you need to be careful the most. Uh, because resources like images, audio, and JSON files are by far the largest source of unnecessary overhead in iOS. But thankfully, they're also the easiest ones to fix. Uh, generally, what you want to do here is simply just don't ship resources at all, uh, just opting to instead downloading them on demand via a CDN, if that's something that you can do. Uh, but this is not always possible. If the, if the content is supposed to be available offline, for example, then you just have no choice. So if you can't do this, and you're going to ship a pull request that adds resources to the app, what can you do? To answer, to answer that, we just need to look at the facts. By far, the number one source of overhead and resources is not using the right formats. There you go. Uh, and the solution to this couldn't be more straightforward. We just don't do that. If you're shipping images, SVG is the best format for small icons while HEIC is the most efficient format for general images. Uh, HEIC is a really good format for iOS apps. It's basically 50% smaller than JPEGs, uh, but still supports transparency like PNG. This is essentially the format that you have when you take a picture on, the, on your iPhone. SVG is vector format, so that's why it's better if you have something small. If you're shipping text like JSON, you can save a lot of size by creating a habit of stripping them from things that is not actually necessary, like white spaces, if in the case of JSON. I think one good example to put here are Lottie JSONs. If you use the Lottie animation framework on your, on your app, you're probably shipping some very large JSONs to be able to support those animations. But if you actually look at those files uh, and understand how the, the format works, you see that actually most of it is completely unnecessary, and you can just wipe it out. So at Spotify, we, we even have a script that just strips all of the stuff, and it greatly saves on, on the size. What about audio? Audio is more complicated, but it generally follows the same idea as images. If you have a short file effect, uh, effect Apple recommends you to use the CAF format with AAC codecs. Uh, while for general audio, you can try MP3 and just reducing bit rates. But you need to keep in mind, audio is extremely complicated, especially in iOS, 
So there can be more things at play here, like hardware acceleration. I, I don't even know how to explain, honestly. Uh, so when dealing with audio optimizations in iOS, it's probably best to go the long way and understand the details of how audio works before trying something with it. But generally, just using the formats already does a pretty good job. All right, but formats are not the only source of overhead in resources. Where you place them can also be a problem. In general, in iOS, you should always use asset catalogs. Never have freestanding files, always use catalogs. There are multiple reasons for this, uh, but in general, the most relevant ones in this case are, one, it makes your code signature over uh, footprint smaller, and two, you get better compression from Apple when you actually submit it to the App Store. Uh, in fact, one very underrated feature of catalogs is that you can actually configure how individual files can be compressed uh, on the asset catalog window, uh, which means that if you have an image that shows up for a very short amount of time, you can actually save more size by picking one of the lossy options. Of course, this reduces the quality, so that's why you need to be a little bit careful with it. But of course, there are way more things that I could potentially show you here. Luckily for us, in this case, this is a problem that Apple is really interested in. Uh, if you want to learn more about what you can do involving resources specifically, I find that these two articles from their ad Apple's documentation does a really good job at explaining what you can do on this area. Outside of that, you find that every .dc uh, on every year, they tend to have at least one session about this sort of like bundle resources overhead. They're generally quite interested about this. All right. The next area I want to show you is Swift overhead. This refers to this overhead that is caused by the literal Swift code that you write. To be more specific, depending on how you write certain patterns in Swift, you can cause the compiler to push a lot more stuff into the binary than you think it is. I'm going to show you some examples of that, but before I do that, the first thing I you want to make sure here uh, is to make sure that your project is actually configured so that Swift will compile your project with size in mind. And, and you do that by simply enabling these two flags in Xcode, optimize for size and whole module optimization. These two flags in conjunction, they allow Swift to make some pretty strong size optimizations. So if you don't have them turned on, uh, you can do it literally right now. I'll let you know that there's a reason they're not turned on by default though. Uh, this can cause both your build times and runtime performance to get a little bit slower. Uh, but we find that for iOS apps specifically, this trade-off tends to be worth it. Cool. So I was mentioning that certain Swift patterns can be bad for app size. What do I mean by that? Okay, here's one example. In Swift, one of the most expensive mistakes you can make is not using structs properly. If you care about app size, you need to be really careful with structs. Now, someone might be thinking, what the hell are you talking about? We love structs. They're perfect. But unfortunately, the sad reality of, Swift's, of Swift is that when it comes to app size and performance, uh, structs are almost always worse than classes. They're really bad. I wouldn't go as far as saying that you should never use structs, uh, but it, I think it's important for you to at least be aware of some of these problems so that they can catch you off guard. I'm going to show you some examples. One thing you need to be careful with structs is that struct composition, composition is really expensive. Composition refers to the practice of nesting types together, like in this example where we have a struct which has a property that is another struct, which has a property that is another struct, and so on and so forth. Um, in theory, there is nothing wrong with this. This is a very normal pattern. But the problem is that today, the compiler is not very good at handling this. If you do this with structs specifically, the compiler may need to push a really large amount of overhead to support this composition. And when I say gigantic, I truly mean it. How much overhead exactly you get depends on some factors like how deep the composition is, how many properties each struct has, and most importantly, how many times you're doing this across your code base. Uh, but in our experience, even in a medium-sized app, this overhead amounts to like dozens of megabytes, literally, in total, if you do it a lot. But composition is not the only reason why you need to be careful with structs. Things like storing reference types in structs and declaring structs with mutable properties, these are patterns that are also known to cause issues with compiler metadata if you're not careful about how much you do them across your code base. So what are you supposed to do here? Well, in this case, my recommendation is that you should probably ignore this. So while structs can be expensive, they're not really supposed to be expensive. 
these are issues in the compiler that will likely be improved in the near future. So I wouldn't suggest you to change the way you write code just because of it. Just be aware that this is a thing. And if you're watching this talk in the future, maybe this has been fixed. But as you saw, this, this can be really bad. So if you don't like the idea of doing nothing, I have two tips that you can apply in this case. In general, you cannot run away from this problem, uh, but we find that in many cases where it happens, the devs were using structs for no reason other than structs are easy to write. So in these cases, using a class not only fixes the overhead, it actually also makes the code more correct from a semantics perspective. Just be aware that you can use the classes for everything though, they have their downsides, so you can do this all the time. My other tip is that if your app is written in Swift UI, you need to triple your attention because Swift UI, everything is a struct. So, which means that those problems are very easy to come by if, you, if you're using an app that is fully written in Swift UI. In fact, Swift UI is how we found some of these issues in the first place. That's something to be, to keep in mind. But enough about structs. Uh, when it comes to Swift itself, there's also one more thing that I want to show you. Unused code. Now, you may look at this and think, oh, that's, that's obvious, right? Unused code. But actually, it's not obvious, and I will show you why. In general, you don't have to worry about unused code in your project, because the compiler is really good at getting rid of it. Take this struct, for example, that has some store properties and a method. If it turns out to be the case that this method is not being used anywhere in our code base, and you're using the flags that we mentioned earlier, in most cases, the compiler knows that this is the case, and will be able to completely remove it from the binary without any action on, on your part. So what is the problem here? The problem is that this only works if the content in question is static in nature. If the content is instead dynamic in nature, for example, because it's part of a protocol requirement, then the compiler cannot do that anymore because now it could be the case that you are calling it indirectly by referencing the protocol itself. The compiler has no idea who's implementing the protocol in a case like this, so it cannot optimize the code like it could before. This is a problem that I refer to as unnecessary dynamic dispatching, and it's probably something that you have a lot in your app. Why? Mostly because of these funny guys. You know them very well. They are protocols for which the compiler automatically generates conformances for you. And what we have noticed is that because the compiler does all of this heavy lifting for you, a lot of people kind of develop a habit of adding them to the structs, even though they don't actually need them, just because it's easy. And essentially, this, is, this can be really bad, because by doing that, you can be accidentally introducing the issue of unnecessary dynamic dispatching into your code. You see, these protocols, they're not free. The methods that the compiler generates for you can be really big, depending on how many properties only you have in your struct. So if you're not actually using those protocols, that's a lot of unnecessary crap in your, in your app. Look at it, it barely fits the screen. I don't even think that's the entire thing. It is. So for a large-sized app, this problem can easily amount to several megabytes. My first tip to you here is to only create a habit of adding protocols to structs if you truly need them. Don't add them just because it's cool. Uh, if it turns out to be the case that you need to protocol for unit testing purposes but not actually in production, there's a trick that you can do. You can actually gate the conformance behind the debug macro check like this in the picture. Uh, and it prevents the overhead from slipping into the abstract build, but you still get the unit testing features that you need. Other than that, learning how dynamic dispatching works in Swift and where it happens can also make, help you make smarter decisions when it comes to, to the sort of stuff. If you want to learn more about Swift-related problems, I would say that hanging around the official Swift forums and being more familiar with how the compiler works is probably the best thing you could do here. Uh, but WWC can also contain a lot of cool information about this. Uh, in fact, there's one specific session from 2016 called Understanding Swift Performance uh, that I really think you, you can watch if you haven't because it describes in a lot more detail some of the, the things that we are showing you here today. Okay. So un up until this point, I have showed you problems and solutions that you can manage by yourself as an individual. But some people don't like that. Some people want to go straight into the hardcore stuff, and that's all about project overhead. That's all it is about. This refers to problems that are not necessarily your code's fault, but rather how your project is set up and how iOS works internally. And out of everything I've showed you today, this is definitely the hardest because it not only requires your company to have dedicated infrastructure teams, uh, it also often requires your members to have deep knowledge about how Swift and iOS works internally. 
These are also not things that you treat for a specific pull request like you would for other areas. This usually refers to large architectural changes of how your project works. So there's one warning here. For the love of God, don't try this at home. This is, this is super dangerous and will absolutely destroy your project if you don't know what you're doing. So remember yesterday's talk from Alana, she was mentioned she had a problem with app shortcuts because even though there's a problem in the project, it worked because Xcode doesn't say anything. Uh, that's the sort of thing you're dealing with here. You're just going completely off the script. Nobody will help you. So this is super dangerous. Uh, but even though this is the case, I want to show you some examples of this because it's, one, it's really interesting stuff. And it gives you an idea of what we work with at Spotify. So I think you would enjoy having me show you this. All right, so what's this about? Here's one example. This only applies if you have multiple languages in your app. If your app is localized and you're doing it by using Xcode native localization features, you can save a lot of size by just not doing that and doing your own stuff. This re the reason is because the string files that Xcode generates are super inefficient. All of the comments, white space, and duplicated keys that you see here are a completely waste of space. You don't need any of that. So if you support many languages like Spotify does, that is a lot of crap. So what large companies do nowadays is that they post-process these files after the app is compiled so that the data can be stored in a more efficient way. If you combine this with the fact that you can actually zip those files afterwards, um, it, saves, it saves you a lot of stuff. So we do this at Spotify, and today we can attribute almost 20 megabytes of a reduced app size just by doing this, like just by doing this. Uh, so there's a downside to this though. Uh, you have to write a framework that knows how to unzip and read this different efficient format. Uh, so that's the dangerous part here. Uh, but in our opinion, this is, this is quite worth it if you can get it working. Another thing I want to show you has to do with the compiler. This is not necessarily a problem. It's just something that you can do. When we talked about Swift, I mentioned that you should turn on these two flags because they allow you, they allow Swift to optimize things more aggressively. And maybe some of you even already knew this was a thing. But what you might not know is that you can go way beyond this. So the LLVM project has lots of optimization capabilities itself. And because Swift uses LLVM under the hood, that means we can actually use it for our Swift apps even though Apple hasn't necessarily exposed them like neatly in Xcode for you to select in the dropdown. And that's what Spotify and other large companies do. Out of all of these features, I would say that there are two of them that are quite popular nowadays. The first one is machine outlining. What this feature does is essentially remove as much duplicated code as possible from the binary. This is something that Swift also does when you turn on those flags that we talked about. Uh, but the difference here is that LLVM's outliner is a lot more aggressive towards making your app smaller than Swift would normally be because Swift tries to make a balance between size and performance. So if you enable this on top of Swift's optimizer, you get a pretty good reduction of size compared with not doing it. Okay, similarly, we have Thing LTO. LTO stands for link time optimization, and Thing LTO itself is a modern take on a concept called cross-module optimization, which is essentially a step above of the whole module optimization uh, that we have in Swift. Uh, this allows your app to be optimizing ways that were essentially impossible before, at the cost of making your build times really slow. Uh, so now you might think, look at these things. You think, wow, this, this sounds great, like it's just some flags, I'm gonna put this on my project right now and enjoy some pretty good reductions in app size. So I'll say it again, my brother in Christ, please don't put these flags in your project if you value your, your MacBook, it will catch on fire. Uh, so actually, these flags are really safe if you use them in Swift or Objective-C modules, but in Swift, they are super dangerous. In fact, as of speaking, Thing LTO, it doesn't even work for Swift, it just, it just explodes your project. So how can you learn more about this type of stuff? It's hard to say because project and operating system overhead involves a crap ton of stuff. Uh, but when it comes to those specific things that I showed you, I say that there are four great sources that comes to my mind. First, the Swift forums again, if you like compiler stuff. Uh, second, the LLVM forums, if you want to be on top of even crazier compiler information that is not related to Swift specifically. Uh, Third, developer blocks from large companies. These can be a great source for this kind of crazy stuff 
most, if not all, large tech companies out there, they have a tech blog, and it's not uncommon for them to post research about things that they have done in quality area, and in a way that can be quite easy to understand. So if you think that lurking in the official Swift forums is a bit too scary, uh, these blogs can be a really good source of information. And last but not least, if you haven't heard about the Mobile Native Foundation, I really recommend you to check that out. This is essentially a collaboration between many different large companies like Spotify, Airbnb, Lyft, Uber, Microsoft, Twitter, if you can say Twitter still. Uh, and we share with, with each other learnings on how to build large-scale iOS apps, such as Spotify. But the thing is that anyone can actually join this and participate and read this discussion. So this is a great source of information, not for stuff that I have shown you, uh, but also everything else regarding high-scale mobile development. OK, I'm sorry for showing you so much content. You might be feeling extremely overwhelmed right now. And if you are, I totally understand. Uh, optimizing apps is something that just takes a lot of effort to understand. You have app size, you have performance. I, I get tired just thinking about it. This is not something that you figure out just by listening to some talk. But remember what I said earlier on. There is a reason why we do this. Yes, we want to provide a better experience for our users. But you don't actually need to have all of these sophisticated systems of large tech companies, or even this very detailed knowledge about compilers to be able to start applying some of these concepts yourself. I show you these things because that's how it works at Spotify, and so that's what I think you want me to show. But actually, you don't have to do any of that. You can operate at a much simpler level than this. Simply being aware that app size can be a problem is already a great step. Forget all of this concrete stuff that I showed you. It's important, but you don't actually need them to get started. Like with most other things in tech, these complicated concrete beats are not things that you do all at once. These are things that you achieve little by little as time goes, and you decide to invest more resources into these problems. So every time I give a talk about some weird concept like this, uh, I like to give the same advice. Uh, I always advocate that it's very good for you, a developer, to know that different, th different things exist and like what's possible to do and so on. Uh, but also, you shouldn't worry too much about replicating what, what, what other companies are doing uh, into your own project if you don't actually have that need. Uh, you see, I, sometimes I get lots of messages on LinkedIn for things like, Bruno, what, what architecture does Spotify use? Bruno, does, Swift UI, does Spotify like Swift UI? Do you like this? Do you like that? Do you ta-ta-ta? What do you do? Uh, and when I give the answer, I notice that sometimes the devs, they feel the need that they, they should replicate those things. They think like, oh, if Spotify is doing this thing, oh, if Apple is doing this thing, if Microsoft is doing this thing, then it must be good, right? Then we should do that in our project and so like be more like them because, I don't know, whatever you think about this. And that's just not the right way to go. You see, every project is different. Uh, what architecture you should use? If you use, should you use Swift UI? Which framework should you embed? The answer to those things is not what other people are doing or who is the reference in this area. The answer to this thing is what makes sense for what you are trying to build and which resources your company has and so on. This time I'm talking about app size, uh, but I think this thought applies to everything in iOS. So I'd like you to think about that. By keeping app size in mind, uh, we can create apps that are efficient, user-friendly, and accessible to people all around the world. Uh, so I hope you got to learn something interesting here today. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. So do we have questions? Hi, thank you uh, for the great talk. Um, I wonder, do you know if this localization issue that you mentioned, is this kind of addressed with this new string dictionary that they showed in the last WWDC? Uh, I had, I had a to-do task to check on that, but I'm not sure. I haven't checked, so I want to know. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, hey, uh, awesome talk, thanks. Um, also, one thing that I uh, kind of did like very recently was to also remove unnecessary resources from third-party SDKs that you're embedding. For example, Imagely, 
has a lot of resources in their SDKs that you might not necessarily use, right? Do you guys do something similar as well, where you like post-process as the case? Yeah, so, so this is a good question. Generally, when it comes to frameworks, whether or not it will ship un unnecessary stuff depends on how you're linking it. Uh, most, most of the times when you download something off the internet, they ship it as a dynamic framework. And to a dynamic framework, generally what you get is, is what you're shipping. Uh, the nature of how the, those frameworks work is that you are supposed to share them across different spaces, so there's no, no cross-processing happening directly. Uh, so what we do generally is to actually ship the source code as if it was something that we had written. So like we just clone it internally and we compile it as part of our project and we, yes, and we link it statically across the app because essentially then Xcode, or Swift in this case, treats it the same as it would any other code and then you can apply all of those aggressive optimizations like that code stripping and, and so on. So to answer your question more directly about resource stripping post-process, usually what we do is if Spotify wants to ship something externally, uh, we let them know and say, oh, we don't actually use it and so on. And sometimes we even get the special version and so on. Uh, but otherwise, we just try not to use dynamic frameworks. Then we don't have to do this too much. Hi, uh, great tech, uh, talk, great set of tips. Um, I uh, wonder, you mentioned the argument of quasi the, um, the, the marketing argument that you need to have more users, but there is another reason to uh, reduce the size of your app, which is the ethical argument, reducing the amount of electricity which is uh, needed. Uh, and if you have a small app, it's not very relevant. If you are Spotify, it is very relevant. Yeah. Is this discussion inside of Spotify also important? Yes, we actually do that. I didn't include it for reasons of time, but we actually do. One of the reasons why we do this is especially to cut down on emissions. Okay, thanks. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much. It was a great talk with uh, some, some great tips. Just a question you don't need to answer uh, that. Uh, so our app, <laughs> our app has about, uh, I, I checked it, 123 megabytes, but we have to ship uh, like a RAM database, we have RX Swift, RX Coco, and all that stuff. Not a lot, a uh, lot of um, 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 resources, of course, strings and stuff. But what makes the Spotify app so big? It has about 132 megabytes, which is not very few. So uh, Spotify is a really big app. It may not look like at first when you just open it and there's a home and so on, but there are so many features all across the app. And also we have Objective-C code a lot, and I think I didn't mention this. When I talked about dynamic dispatching, Objective-C is 100% dynamic dispatch. So if you have any Objective-C code installed, there's no stripping or whatever, because that's just how Objective-C works. So I would say partially Objective-C, partially, it's just a really big app. <laughs> Thank you. We have like integrations like BMW and uh, all those cars, and like these SDKs are just massive as themselves. Uh, thanks a lot for the uh, talk. Uh, so you mentioned with assets that you should try to use asset catalogs as much as possible and also try to use HAIC uh, for larger images. But as far as I know, you cannot put HAIC into an asset catalog. Apple just throws it out. So uh, what would you then recommend to have a standalone HAIC image or a PNG in an asset catalog? Thank you. I'm not sure what you mean. You can absolutely do that. Maybe maybe something else. We can check on that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for a nice talk. Uh, so you also ma mentioned uh, about uh, using of Strack and uh, how it impacts size uh, with Swift UI. Uh, I heard something about it. Did you did some sort of research uh, about comparison like uh, Swift UI application? only Swift UI application and uh, UI kit application, how it will it impact actual size of application? Because I heard a lot about uh, how structs uh, increase size of app, but I didn't do real research. Maybe you did something like it? Uh, yeah, so the Swift UI part is, is interesting. Uh, when we first saw this, the, the story behind it is that we have the second app called Spotify for Artists, and that app is written in I think mostly in SwiftUI, 
and they just made a really small change in some composition, and it completely collapsed the app size. That's when we first got alerted about it. Uh, the history of SwiftUI at Spotify is that there, is a sp there are specific teams that they are running experiments on like very specific localized features on the app. And I think right now they're trying to put there into this specific feature and they will try to analyze this impact. There has been some documents so far like they know that this can be a thing, uh, but for in the case of Spotify specifically, uh, we just have to keep trying and see what will happen. So there is some research, but it's hard to say exactly because a lot of the stuff is very deep into the compiler and there's not much information out there. So yeah, we have some, some guesses. We talked to some people from Apple, uh, but yeah. Thank you for your talk. Uh, my question is, have you had any first-hand experience with just throwing out the image files and drawing them programmatically, say, with core graphics? Because uh, you mentioned Game Boy games. That's how they did it hmm. back in the day, I guess. So, Yeah, I think that's actually super interesting. I had this idea of can we actually make Spotify just draw some of the common images on, on the app? I, I never tried it though. I think it would be complicated because some images can be very complex and you would probably have to ship some code to represent the, the paths and so on. Maybe for vectors it could work quite well, uh, but I think that's a really interesting thought. Thank I haven't you. tried it personally. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. Actually, as far as I understood, the resources and uh, I mean pods which we add to the project like uh, Alum of Air and stuff like this takes too much space. And uh, do you have any recommendations for them? Yeah, so this is similar to the first question. It's not that it takes space, it depends on how you're linking it. Uh, if you're adding a, a framework as, as an external dynamic framework and just linking it in your app, Generally, it will stay like that. You get everything that is on the framework even if you're not truly using it. Uh, but if you actually get the source code into your project and compile it alongside your app and you use static linking, that is very important, uh, then you can actually do this, all of this dead code stripping that the compiler has support to. Then it gets better. Thank you. With regard to drawing images in code, I think uh, SVG is very close to that because basically drawing SVG images in, is an interpreter of mm -hmm. graphics primitives. So, um, and interpreters are usually very good at code size. So, <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> That's it. Uh, we spoke a lot about um, the app size itself um, and great tips, by the way. But you also have these uh, document and data size, which expands over time when you use the app. Do you take certain, like apart from offline music on Spotify, do you take some other steps to reduce that size? With, let's say if the app is being used for a few months or something. Are you talking about storage on the app? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's interesting. That's something that we, we have our target one. Uh, we just didn't get there yet because ownership in, in Spotify is very polarized. We have so many engineers. And there was a team that used to be responsible for storage, uh, but they moved into something else. So there's a little of a black hole into that area. Uh, but it's something that we are actually trying to build instrumentation on. Two quick questions. The first one is, this goes, we speak a lot, about, a lot about generating code. Swift macros, they generate a lot of code. If you think about observable, for example. So what is your take on, on this? And the other one is, I'm guessing that a lot of this is documented somewhere on the developer blogs or, or do you have at Spotify release some kind of, I don't know, open source tools or whatever, you know what I mean, that you can give back to the community? Yeah, uh, what was the first question again? I have the memory of a goldfish. Uh, Swift, uh, Swift macros? Yes, Swift macros, yes, sorry. Uh, yeah, the macros are interesting. Actually, my opinion is a little on a different abstraction than that. I just generally don't like syntax sugar so much 
uh, you know, and have those features, it just hides all the complexity and it makes it look super easy, but it's actually really complicated behind. I think that's good at some extent. Uh, I, I do like macros, yes, uh, as long as you actually understand what is actually being generated. Uh, but I think when it comes to Swift macros itself, um, uh, with the static linking, you can actually cut a lot of the, the junk that you don't use, so it may not necessarily be too much of an issue. Except if you use protocols, then you get back to the, one of the problems in the, in the talk. And the second? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Very short memory. Uh, if you um, give back to the community in terms of, uh, obviously, uh, blog blocks. posts or open source tools or whatever, so it depends, a lot of this information comes from Apple internally. Um, if you have the, the guts, you can actually look at the Swift compiler code and that, that do some of this stuff out, uh, but that's really hard. So usually the main source of information tends to be WWDC because they, they just distill this into something that is easily understandable. Uh, but otherwise, yes, some companies, they post blogs about this, uh, but also the Swift forums can also have some hidden threads of interesting information about this sort of stuff. Just, just, it's not a question, but I found it interesting that you say you don't like um, um, when the code is written for you with uh, Swift macros, for example. But if you take it to an extreme, we would still be writing codes with bits and bytes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, or There's assembler a balance, at yeah. best case. So for me, I, I'm always happy when somebody else is writing the code for me. Yeah, it's definitely a balance. So thank you, Bruno. Please give him a big round of applause.